Follow us on social media and please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any updates from our ALS experts. Another time that we get together. I'd like to say a little something to special to anybody who's new tonight. You have found your extended family. And after the presentation, we're going to have a little get together that won't be recorded. And if you could introduce yourself to everyone, you would get to see you have an extended family and they might just have a jewel that they would like to share with you. So don't be shy and welcome. With Thank that, you. Lisa, over to you. Thanks, McFinn. Welcome everyone to tonight's ALS talk. I'm Lisa Deegan and I am part of the Everything ALS team and our entire team has been affected by ALS. And so for anyone joining us um, for the first time tonight, I just wanna share why everything ALS exists. So it is to pay tribute to those that are affected currently by this disease and also to the loved ones that we have lost. And we are really working here, hard here at Everything ALS towards a cure by focusing on getting earlier diagnosis for ALS and also progression tracking, which will help us to better understand the course of this disease and advanced therapeutics. So please join in, in our citizen-led research efforts. We could use your help. Sign up at everythingals.org forward slash research. Okay, we will kick it off. We're gonna do um, like a 10 minute presentation on um, TPN 101, which is a clinical trial for patients with ALS and the C9ORF72 mutation. So we have Dr. Andrew Statlin, who's the CMO of Transposon Therapeutics Incorporated, and he's going to give us a brief overview of this trial, and he's going to answer some questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Lisa. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, super. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, our work uh, here today. I want to um, talk a little bit about what's new about the drug that we're studying, because it's really based on very new science, uh, and it's a very interesting hypothesis, we think. And so I do want to spend a few minutes at a high level trying to explain to you uh, what it's about. So this drug is designed to address a new hypothesis about the cause of ALS. It blocks the inflammation in nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord before it starts. So I think you're all aware that to some extent, inflammation is an important component of the pathology of this disease. And we're interested in trying to block that and prevent it. The drug is an oral capsule. It's taken once a day. So uh, simple to take in that respect. It's already been studied in over 200 people healthy volunteers and patients with other illnesses and found to have a very good safety profile. And as I said, we're studying, and as Lisa mentioned, this is a phase two study in people living with ALS who have the C9 ORF72 mutation. And I'll explain a little bit also about why we're interested in that particular population, at least for now. So here's the, a bit of the science behind it. As you all know, uh, our cells have DNA in the nucleus, and that DNA is the blueprint for the cell to make essential proteins. To make the proteins, the DNA gets activated and then it gets confer, uh, made into RNA and other, uh, and then into the proteins. A lot of the DNA in our cells has no function. And if this DNA gets activated and goes through that same process, it can produce products that can be harmful to the cell. So to prevent this from happening, what cells have developed over millions of years of evolution is a way to prevent this non-functional DNA from getting activated. And one of the things that it does is it winds the DNA tightly around proteins called chromatin. And that's what I've illustrated in the picture here. So you can see the DNA blue strands are tightly wound around these per proteins uh, that together are what we call chromatin, and in this state is known as heterochromatin. What happens in ALS? In ALS, this harmful DNA can get activated. And the way that that happens, I think you're all also familiar with the fact that most ALS, in fact, almost all ALS, is associated with a problem in a protein called TDP43. One of the functions of this protein 
is to help the cell to keep the harmful DNA from being activated. So it works together with this chromatin uh, and other proteins to keep this harmful DNA from being in a, in a state that can be activated. When the, in ALS, when the TDP43 no longer functions properly, the DNA can unwind from the heterochromatin as you see here, and it can therefore be in a state that is susceptible to activation. What happens when that occurs? It leads to inflammation. And the way that that happens is through several steps. The DNA is converted into RNA. It's then made into other proteins. Those proteins can make the, the RNA turn back into DNA and the cell recognizes this DNA as harmful. And so it mounts an immune response to it similar to the immune response that a cell would mount to a virus. And as a result of that immune response, the cells become inflamed and that damages the cells. So it's a several step process, but it leads to the neuroinflammation of ALS and ultimately to the neurodegeneration, the loss and damage to cells. What TDP 101 does is it blocks one of the key steps in this process. So by blocking that step, the subsequent steps don't happen and the inflammation doesn't happen and the neurodegeneration doesn't happen. How do we know that this is what's happening? If I just go back for a moment, we know that these steps are happening because if you see those products there, one, two, and three, we can measure some of those both in animal models of disease uh, and also in the brains of patients at um, autopsy, patients who have, uh, who've died, we can measure that. So, sorry. yeah. So. That's how we know that this is a process that does go on in, in ALS. And in animal models, drugs like TPN-101 can block this process and lead to lower amounts of those harmful proteins. The reason that we're studying the C9 mutation is just again, very briefly, there's two reasons. The C9 mutation makes the TDP43 dysfunction worse. And also one of the normal fun functions of C9 is to tamp down inflammation in the cell. So if you get a viral infection, when the infection has been cleared, C9 protein reduces the inflammation that was there so it doesn't go on forever and, and damage the cells. When the infection's over, it stops. Here, that doesn't happen because of the dysfunctional C9. So that's one reason why we think that T TPN 101 might be especially good for ALS, that's due to the C9 mutation. However, if this study that we're currently doing is successful, later we may expand to other forms of ALS, including other familial forms and sporadic ALS, because the TDP43 problem will still be there. So a little bit about the study. We're gonna include 40 participants. People with ALS and the C9 mutation are eligible, but if they also have frontotemporal dementia, which as you know, does occur uh, in patients, uh, people with ALS, uh, they're, all, they're still eligible. It is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial for the first six months, but 60% will get the active drug TPN-101 and only 40% the placebo. And after six months, everyone can get the TPN-101 for six more months. We we're doing a large number of evaluations, some very specialized blood tests in order to check for those levels of things that I already told you about to see if we're reducing those markers of inflammation and of neurodegeneration, but also the standard clinical scales uh, that are used to evaluate people living with ALS. We are doing uh, lumbar punctures, uh, again, because to measure some of those components, it's important to look in the CSF, the, the compartment that's closest to the brain. So before and after treatment, we do do uh, a lumbar puncture, but the drug is, is taken orally. So if you want to learn more, um, you can get in touch with us. The uh, operational person working on the study is Jay Soto. His number is here. We have a um, email address that you can write to to, uh, and we'll send you more information about the study. Or if you know how to look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is the 
NIH website that maintains information about clinical trials. You can look there. If you search just for either TPN 101 or here is our NCT number. And this information, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the people at Everything ALS will provide all this to you if you would, if you express an interest. Uh, of course, you can get in touch with us directly, uh, but we hope that uh, this little presentation has given you a feel for, for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and the study is underway. Uh, we have an, a number of sites already up and running in the United States. There's going to be probably about 15 sites in the U.S. altogether working on this trial. Uh, we're also doing the trial in a few countries in Europe, but I know that uh, this audience is American. So if, I, if there is a minute or two for questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, Dr. Satlin, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the other Everything ALS team members. I'm going to read you a couple of questions from the chat. Um, the first one says, you talked about how people with the C9 genetic mutation can be part of the trial without having the official ALS diagnosis yet. Um, is there a possibility that this will be for prophylaxis for C9 carriers? Yeah, no, it, currently it is not. Um, it, patients, um, pe people do have to have ALS at this point to be in this trial, because it's the first trial that we're doing uh, in any of these disorders. So um, it's important that the people do have clinical symptoms that we can measure because we do want to see whether there's going to be a clinical improvement. Uh, this is not a drug that would only prevent progression of ALS. It, we hope it will do that. But because of it's reducing the inflammation associated with the disease, we also have the hope that it will improve some symptoms. And we want to at least see if we can get some sense of that uh, with this first trial. Later, anything is open. It could be possible for prophylactic treatment. Uh, as I said, it could be in populations that don't have the C9 mutation, uh, sporadic or, or even other genetic forms, but that's all, that's all for the future. Okay. And then the other question is besides the C9 um, eligibility, is there any other qualifications or disqualifications for, to be in the study? Uh, there are, but they're not many. Um, if the symptoms have been present for, I think it's more than three years, then um, that would be uh, excluded. Uh, you know, um, people have to be otherwise in general, good health. Uh, it's important that they be able to swallow the capsules uh, also. Uh, but apart from that, no, there's not a lot of uh, specific exclusions that would limit uh, people being able to go into this trial. Okay, um, wonderful. Well, we will make sure to um, share your information and then others can reach out to you guys with either questions or um, interest if they uh, potentially qualify. And we want to say thank you for, for giving us this presentation and all the information. And we are excited to see how the TPN 101 um, study goes in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody listening. Yeah, thank you for letting us have a little time. Yes, thank you for sharing all that information. So okay. if there happens to be additional questions along the way, um, send them to info at everythingals.org or there's other, I think Sarah did put something in the chat on where to contact them for questions. And so for tonight's presentation, I'm, I'm honored and super excited to welcome back to the platform, Dr. Hande Osdeenler from Northwestern. And she's gonna talk to us about a new gene therapy for ALS and then we'll follow it by audience Q and A. So Dr. Osdeenler is an Associate Professor of Neurology at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, focusing on understanding the biology and pathology of upper motor neurons. Degeneration of these neurons lead to HSP, PLS, and its defining factor for ALS diagnosis. Her lab has made important contributions for understanding the underlying causes of their selective vulnerability and generate numerous tools and model systems to reveal their biology as well as factors that lead to their de degeneration. So thank you, Hande, for being with us tonight. To unmute myself first. So thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm very excited to share one of our recent uh, discoveries and it's about uh, gene therapy in ALS, and not to the spinal motor neurons, but to the upper motor neurons. So first, I would like to emphasize um, that the movement starts in the brain. So the brain component in ALS 
is actually very important uh, for the uh, initiation and modulation of voluntary movement. Because in simple terms, the motor neuron circuitry has components in the brain, in the spinal cord, and of course the spinal motor neurons project to the muscle, and they are the ones actually who initiate movement. So we need spinal motor neurons to have control over the muscle. But the input that goes from the brain to the spinal motor neurons are also very important. So, you know, we don't think that needs to be dismissed. And if you look at the uh, upper motor neurons, the cells, the neurons, they are very complicated. Their cell body is right here, and it's very large compared to other cells and neurons in the brain. And they have a very prominent apical dendrite. And, opa, and I'm going to mention about this apical dendrite uh, during my talk. This apical dendrite is an extension to the topper, uh, upper layers of the brain. And that apical dendrite is actually this site where uh, these upper motor neurons are modulated by other cortical neurons. So this is where they collect information and they where they integrate information, okay? And then they have a very long axon. And this axon can be extremely long. I mean, especially for tall people, it could be one meter, one and a half meter long. But this axon goes all the way from top, you know, the, from the brain to the spinal cord. Okay, this is just one axon. Imagine um, how elaborate uh, the neuro neuroanatomy is. And these neurons are very few in numbers, and but their function is extremely important. Uh, for starting and modulating voluntary movements, which uh, degenerates uh, in ALS patients. So I think the cortex and the upper motor neurons do matter in ALS because without the uh, brain, without the cortical uh, neurons, we cannot really initiate or modulate uh, movements effectively. So for, for many, many years, the uh, idea that the cortical neurons, the cortical motor neurons degenerate because spinal motor neurons degenerate uh, was overwhelming. So people believed that the upper motor neurons die because the spinal motor neurons die. And then this degeneration was a one-way street going from the uh, muscle to the spinal motor neurons to the uh, cortex. So the cortex, they say, was going to degenerate anyways. So the cortex had never really been the attention for uh, developing therapies because cortex was going to die anyways. So the emphasis was on the um, you know, spinal motor neuron and the neuromuscular junction. So this dying back hypothesis it, uh, you know, led to the uh, idea that the cortex really doesn't matter. And then dying forward hypothesis, which says, cortex degeneration is an early event and it is driving the ALS pathology. So that, you know, upper motor neuron degeneration is an early event, okay? So that it actually drives it. So these two ideas, <laughs> of course, you know, they were not in agreement. And, um, but now I, I think that um, it's like London Bridge is falling down, right? There are two uh, legs to the bridge and both uh, legs, both the cortex and the spinal motor neuron degenerates almost simultaneously. So it's not that one's degeneration is dependent on the others. They are both very important components of the circuitry. And I want to tell you that even though we call them upper motor neuron, lower motor neuron, as if they are the same neuron, one lives in the top floor, the other one lives in the bottom floor, it's actually not true. These are very, very different neuron populations. Their transcription factors, uh, the transcription factors that are important for their uh, birth specification development are very different. They, are, they depend on different growth factors for survival. Uh, you know, uh, for example, one of them express chat, the other one doesn't. Uh, their targets are different. Their birth dates are different. Their locations are different. Everything about them is actually different. So it is us who call them upper, lo upper neuron, lower neuron, but they are distinct neuron populations. They are just collaborators. They are just team members. They work together, but they are very different from each other. And that's why I don't think that in our mind, we should think one dies first and then the other, or this one dies and then this. I think it's more complex than this. It, it is possible that they both degenerate at the same time, or maybe uh, in, in, different, in different ways. So then the questions in the field were, like, do upper motor neurons die just because spinal motor neurons die? Because if that's the case, 
there's really no need to focus on the brain component. And then are upper motor neurons really a good cellular target for gene therapy, right? And what would happen if we improve their health? Like, you know, do they really matter? So uh, I'm gonna talk about the article, uh, the manuscript that we recently published in uh, Gene Therapy, and it was actually selected as the reader's choice uh, as well. And we find that the upper motor neurons are indeed targets for gene therapy, okay? So their degeneration does not depend on spinal motor neuron loss. They're independent, right? It's, it's not, their degeneration is not a consequence of spinal motor neuron loss, and that we can actually improve their health by gene therapy. So this is also very important, that they respond to gene therapy, okay? And I'm very happy that Dr. Clive Svensson actually wrote a um, commentary about this, um, that the cortex is important in ALS. And this slide is very technical, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll try my best to take you through. So to be able to understand if cortex degeneration is dependent on spinal motor neuron degeneration, we had to uh, tease out the brain and the spinal cord in two different um, domains. There are uh, transgenic mouse models which allow us to delete genes only in the spinal cord or only in the cortex. For example, the HB9 pre model uh, allows you to uh, delete genes or express genes only in the spinal motor neurons, okay? And RB, uh, RB, RBP4 pre line allows you to modulate genes only in layer five of the motor of the cortex and mainly large excitatory neurons. So that's very good. Now, we previously found that UCHL1 is, uh, is an important molecule for motor neurons. And in the absence, the upper motor neurons degenerate. And spinal motor neurons also show uh, neuronal uh, dysfunction. So by crossing the UCHL1 um, uh, mice with the RBP4, HP9, we can delete UCHL1 selectively only in the upper motor neurons. Here, for example, you can see that they actually are upper motor neurons here, but they don't express UCHL1. So we delete, you take an eraser, this is like a molecular eraser, and you erase whatever gene you want from a distinct neuron population. So this is very complex, and it took about three or four years for us to generate these uh, mouse models but we were able to very selectively delete the gene of interest only from the upper motor neurons in the brain, okay? Or delete uh, also uh, UCHL1 only in the spinal motor neurons. Look at this, for example, see, they don't express. And this is the uh, uh, using the um, transgenic mice for the spinal motor neuron expression. So now we can actually delete uh, a disease-related gene only in the cortex or only in the spinal cord. So then we can actually begin to ask the question, upper motor neurons, upper motor neurons, will you still survive when spinal motor neurons are healthy? Or upper motor neurons, upper motor neurons, will you still survive when spinal motor neurons are, uh, are sick? You know, they, they don't have the gene, but you do. So we actually can do multiple experiments like this to understand their, uh, uh, their dependence on each other, okay? All right, so it's very, I mean, it was very hard to explain this, but um, this also be, depends on the work that we have done in the past that uh, in the absence of UCHL1, upper motor neurons show profound degeneration. And again, the spinal motor neurons that they also require UCHL1, okay? And th this study is uh, very interesting because, you know, in our bodies, we have the sensory nervous system. And of course, we also have the, uh, the motor neurons, right? The motor branch. And here, the femoral nerve is, uh, is very interesting because it has nerve fibers from DRG, which is the sensory. And it also has the nerve fibers from the ventral root coming from the spinal motor neurons. So it has a motor, motor branch. So you can actually look at the um, axonal um, paths in the, let's say, uh, sensory. They are, look very comparable. But if you look in the motor branch, look, they are very diseased. And this is 
same mouse, same nerve, different branch. So there's very selective motor neuron um, pa uh, pathology, okay? Sensory branch is just fine, but the motor branch, the axons degenerate, there is, uh, there is uh, immense um, problem. So this was very clear visualization of the sense, the difference between sensory and motor. Okay, so then we said, let's use AAB gene delivery method, uh, putting from the spinal cord. And when you inject the virus from the spinal cord, they will be retrogradely transduced, which means it will go from axon to the cell body. Retro means backwards. And we can actually use you know, the UCHL1 null mice, which is the disease mice, and uh, then RB4, you remember, this is the one that doesn't have UCHL1 in the cortex. And HB9 is the one that doesn't have UCHL1 in the spinal cord, okay? So when you don't have it in the cortex, you begin to have some like vacuoles and degenerating uh, phenotype. Well, when you don't have it in the spinal motor neuron, uh, you seem to be doing fine. Here, this is more detailed uh, figure. So in the UCHL1 now, we already know that there is massive degeneration. And this apical dendrite degeneration is very important. And we see this in, uh, in, human, in humans as well. So this is not just a mouse uh, pheno phenotype. And in the RBP4, which means when it is in the cortex, you see pathology. But when the spinal motor neurons don't have it, upper motor neurons say, well, I don't care. So they are still OK. So then their, uh, their disease state or their sickness is not dependent on how spinal motor neurons um, feel or how healthy the spinal motor neurons are. So in the healthy apical dendrite, you see these spines and you see this integrity. So that's very good because then anybody can talk to uh, this neuron and neurons actually speak through these connections with the spines. So that the spine morphology is very important for cortical connectivity. But when they are diseased, look at this, apical dendrites filled with vacuole, they are degenerating, they, they hardly have any spines. I mean, if you have an apical dendrite like this, you know, it's very hard for you to stay in the circuitry. It's very hard for neurons to talk to each other. And upper motor neurons, they require other neurons to speak to them because otherwise, they will be kept in the dark and they won't be able to carry the uh, information from the brain to the spinal cord. That's why uh, the, this uh, state is very, is very bad for the upper motor neurons. And we see this in HSP, in PLS, in ALS. And most interestingly, we also see this not in the, only in mouse models, but also in the bed cells of ALS patients, okay? And here are the quantifications. So to further show that the upper motor neuron degeneration does not really depend on uh, spinal motor neuron uh, health or spinal motor neuron uh, integrity. So they are uh, unique entities, okay? So the idea that they degenerate because spinal motor neurons degenerate may not be fully uh, uh, correct. Of course, they depend on each other, but it's not to the extent that it is a product of their uh, of the spinal motor neuron loss. And again, just to emphasize the importance of the apical dendrites, because both long distance projection neurons and local circuitry neurons, as, as well as the interneurons, all converge on to the apical dendrite, and that's the, how they communicate to them. And then the upper motor neurons are the spokesperson. They listen to everyone. They integrate what everyone is saying, and they say, okay, I'm going to start an action potential, and I'm going to uh, activate this spinal motor neuron so that this motion or this movement can be initiated. But if you don't have a healthy apical dendrite, it's very hard to do that. And again, this is just to show, these are the apical dendrites of bed cells in familial ALS, in FTD ALS, uh, case in FTD ALS, and you can see the apical dendrites filled with vacuoles and uh, they show profound degeneration. So I think we have to find ways to improve the health of the apical dendrite so that the upper motor neurons will be uh, back in the conversation and will be back in the game so that they can actually talk to other neurons and other neurons can talk to them, okay? So this communication is really very important. 
And again, so now we say the upper motor neurons do not degenerate just because spinal motor neurons degenerate. So there's an intrinsic uh, uh, you know, value for their degeneration. We cannot say uh, their degeneration is a function of spinal motor neuron loss. It does not depend on spinal motor neurons. So then this brings us to the idea that they deserve to be investigated as an important component of upper motor neuron circuitry. You know? So we have to take them seriously and they are a very good target. But then how can we treat them? Like what must we do, right? So um, let me see if I can see this. Yeah, uh, I have shown you, for example, the wild type in the wild type, the apical dendrite in the UCHL1 now, look at, compare these two, you can see how fragile they are. And, and now when you give UCHL1 back to a UCHL1 null mice, which doesn't have UCHL1, right? So if you give UCHL1 to a model system, which doesn't have UCHL1, it almost goes back to the normal state. That's pretty good. So then UCHL1 is sufficient to uh, reverse them back to healthy conditions. Like, is it sufficient? And look at the uh, diseased uh, neurons, look at their soma, they shrink, they don't have somatic. So these are somatic branches because they come from the soma. And look, they don't have that many somatic branches. Their apical dendrites are very slim, degenerating. And now when you give UCHL1 back to them, look at that. They look um, pretty neat. They have uh, all these uh, somatic arbors. Apical dendrite is intact. We can even see some spines. And the cell body, we call them the pyramidal shape. It looks pretty good. So that giving UCHL1 to them is, is pretty nice. And it's sufficient to improve their neuronal integrity. But people say, you know what, of course, they lacked UCHL1. Now you give UCHL1. Of course, that's going to happen. Then we asked whether uh, we give UCHL1 to a different model and to a different underlying cause, like upper motor neurons degenerate in uh, SOD1, in TDP, in profilin, in HSP. Like we, there are many different uh, uh, reasons why upper motor neurons degenerate in ALS, in HSP, in PLS. And there are mouse models which show uh, progressive upper motor neuron loss. So then we said, okay, we actually showed uh, the timing and extent of upper motor neuron degeneration in the, in the presence of SOD1 mutation based on this publication. We said, okay, how if we give UCHL1 to an SOD1 mouse uh, or to an upper motor neuron that degenerates because of the SOD1, misfolded SOD1 toxicity, right? So this is like a, a leap going from, uh, because as UCHL1 has never been uh, considered within the context of, uh, uh, or UCHL1 has not been considered within the context of uh, SOD1. But something very, very interesting happens. When we, um, when we give UCHL1 to an SOD1 uh, mouse model, upper motor neurons with SOD1, it also improves their cytoarchitecture. So it, UCHL1 is not only for the UCHL1 null, but also for the SOD1. And that was very interesting because um, what does UCHL1 do? UCHL1 plays many important roles. It is actually uh, important for uh, adding and removing ubiquitin. It plays a very important role for protein uh, turnover and making sure that the, there's less protein aggregation. And it also ha has a role in uh, mitochondrial stability. So th there are many things that UCHL1 does. And upper motor neurons require UCHL1 like crazy, because when we use UCHL1 promoter to drive EGFP expression, we can label upper motor neurons. And it was very interesting for us to see that giving UCHL1 to an SOD1 mouse also improved their survival. Then we said, okay, that's great, that's wonderful, but how about TDP? Because TDP pathology is seen in a wide um, spectrum of ALS patients, especially ALS FTLD patients. Almost all of them have uh, TDP pathology. 
And we were lucky to actually work with a, a TDP model that expresses a, a mutation and that mutation causes uh, upper motor neuron degeneration. And if you look at the upper motor neurons with TDP pathology in this mouse model and ALS patients with TDP pathology, the underlying causes of degeneration at a cellular level is almost identical. And we published this in Acto Neuropathologic a couple of years ago. And this was the mouse model Dr. Bailo has generated. So then we said, okay, how if we give you CHL1 to the upper motor neurons that degenerate due to TDP? So this is again a different biology, a different pathology, like it's a different ball game. And it's very risky experiment. It may work, it may not work, and most likely it's not going to work, but it did. So the apical dendrites, again, in the TDP mice, we know that they degenerate, they have these vacuoles, they lose their spines. So this is a common pathology uh, in all upper motor neurons, in, in all diseased upper motor neurons. And guess what? When we give UCHL1 to the upper motor neurons that have TDP pathology, they also improve their uh, cytoarchitecture. They become uh, healthier, more intact. Likewise, look at the cell body and it goes to very healthy levels. So the degenerating upper motor neurons, when you give them UCHL1, they say, oh, you know, thank you so much. Now I can actually feel um, much better and I have more intact apical dendrites and they, they seem to be happier. So then we said, all right, is, is it just the morphology or something really good happening inside these cells? And we know, for example, in the SOD1, there is misfolded SOD1 uh, accumulation. And we realized that it, this accumulation was reduced so that there is less protein accumulation. And in the TDP, because it's, this is a flag tag, and we know that there is also accumulation of TDP. And we also realized that the protein accumulation was reduced. So it's not just that they look healthier and nicer and more handsome or more beautiful. Functionally, they also have less of the problem that they had. So this is wonderful because then we can say that the upper motor neurons actually respond to gene therapy. So we can deliver genes to them. They would express selectively and then they would respond. And we can improve their health and neuronal integrity by making them express genes that are important for their survival, right? So we think that it is actually possible to develop gene therapy to ALS by targeting the upper motor neurons in the brain. And if we can make the upper motor neurons healthy, and if we can make them uh, go back into the motor neuron circuitry and join the conversation and continue to be modulated by other cortical neurons, there's a very good chance that they will start speaking to the spinal motor neurons. They will start um, you know, rolling the, um, the ball and the conversation and that the motor neuron circuitry will be more functional. So that's our goal. And uh, I'm also happy to report that we received the Spastic Paraplegia Foundation grant together with Nicolas Hatsopoulos because now we want to take the studies from mouse to macaque monkeys, to non-human primates. First of all, to see if we can really deliver the genes of interest by direct motor cortex injection, all right? And if we can get specific and selective transduction of the upper motor neurons by viral gene delivery. So this is also very interesting. And we just submitted our R01 second submission. I hope we get it, we'll see. But our work is actually trying to modulate gene expression by direct motor cortex injection. These are preliminary results, but I wanna show you that even when we do direct motor cortex injection, of course we up, you know, worked on the capsid protein, the promoter, this, that. So I'm just showing you the result, but there were years and years of investigation into this. And I hope you can see that this is layer five of the motor cortex, and you will see these large big dots. Those are the upper motor neurons. And you don't get the whole cortex transduced. It's mainly the upper motor neurons. And this is exactly what we want because we don't want all neurons in the brain to be transduced. We want selective transduction and we want only the neurons that show vulnerability to be transduced so that we don't have off-target effects. And uh, this is what we're trying to achieve. And you can see in layer five, these are the very large neurons, see? And this is the controllateral site. This is the control site, there's no virus. So I think we are beginning to um, transduce upper motor neurons selectively. 
and uh, now our results or also our investigations are uh, beginning to tell us which genes to modulate. And this is important figure because look, this is the site of injection. This is where the highest amount of virus is present, okay? But even then, you don't get non-specific transduction. It's mainly the layer five neurons. So this, these studies are very promising. So overall, I, I, can, I think I can say the upper motor neurons do matter in ALS and also in upper motor neuron diseases like HSP, PLS. And they do not degenerate just because spinal motor neurons degenerate, okay? So let's give them some dignity. And upper motor neurons are feasible cellular targets for gene therapy. They can be modulated. We can have selective transduction of upper motor neurons. And we think that UCHL1 is an important protein for upper motor neuron health. It's not just for the you know, uh, upper UCHL1 null mice, but also within the context of SOD1 and TDP, we can improve their health. So this is also a very good target. And I want to thank people in my lab. We are now 13 people. It's a big lab, but whoever is interested in doing exciting research on upper motor neurons, we always have a place for you. And I'm very thankful for all the foundations and as, uh, also NIH, uh, NIA, and recently we received two DOD grants. And I'm thankful for everyone who support our research. And I'm also thankful for you uh, for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. Lots of great information. Um, I know we have some questions. So I'm going to actually have you stop sharing your screen. Okay. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Sarah. We've met before, but um, I am one of the Everything ALS team members along with Lisa and Brian and myself will be um, giving you the questions from the chat. Um, one question that we had received from an email was, do you by chance know of any research linking ALS and connective tissue disorders, um, like inherited conditions such as Erlo-Stanlos syndrome, Down syndrome, or Marfan syndrome? And do they have any risk for ALS? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm sorry. That's fine. It was it was one that we were emailed, so I appreciate it. Is Brian on? Oh, yes, I am. Sorry about that. Now we can go with start with the other questions. So first question is: Can you give an update on the NU and and sorry NU nine drug trials? Yes. Uh, so NU nine was generated and uh, characterized initially in Dr. Silverman's lab at Northwestern. And we start doing uh, studies together to see if NU9 has an impact on diseased upper motor neurons. So initially when it was discovered, uh, it was discovered to reduce uh, protein aggregation in uh, uh, misfolded SOD1 PC12 cells. So we started our investigations first with the SOD1 mouse model. And we realized that NU9 improves their health makes them send long axons, you know, improves their apical dendrites, improve, improves uh, their overall health. So then we decided to investigate um, if this is also true within the TDP pathology. So we found that it, it, it in these uh, is, uh, uh, you know, making them really happy. Then we tried in vitro, uh, either uh, alone, or in combination with the FDA approved drugs. And we show that when NU9 is given with Adorawan or given with um, Rulozole, it actually improves uh, the neuron health, uh, the upper motor neuron health in vitro. So that was good. So then Dr. Silverman actually started the company, Akava Therapeutics, and he licensed the compound to his own company. So hopefully soon you will see the website of our company. And um, I'm involved as a scientific uh, advisory board member. And uh, we are doing the uh, pre-IND studies, toxicology studies, large mammals. And our goal is to start the phase one clinical trial, hopefully at Northwestern. And uh, we, we will receive our toxic, the results of the toxicology studies within a couple months. And uh, our goal is to initiate phase one, maybe towards the end of this year, but definitely uh, next year. And um, so after this toxicology studies, of course, it's going to be phase two. And um, we were debating whether we should also include HSP patients or PLS patients for these studies. But we don't have um, strong scientific evidence right now for a new nine, you know, working also in the HSP or PLS models. So I'm working on the uh, HSP model. 
but there are really not good uh, models for the PLS. And that's why I think it's going to start uh, first as ALS, but I think the second wave is going to uh, come so that HSP and PLS patients can be uh, included. So we, I'm very hopeful about NU9. The reason is it, it actually uh, accomplishes four important things. One of them is it improves the integrity of mitochondria, the inner membrane of the mitochondria, which is um, very important for generation of ATP and also um, metabolites and um, you know, ensuring that the cell has uh, you know, important metabolites generated. The second is it improves uh, ER, endoplasmic reticulum, and also the uh, integrity of ER so that you know, there are protein production is okay. It reduces protein aggregation, so that's very good. It also improves the cytoarchitectural integrity of the apical dendrites, so that's very important, as I told you here, that that is the site for cortical connectivity, so that's very good. And... Uh, the, the other thing is it, all, uh, it improved the uh, behavior of motor function behavior of uh, especially the TDP mice, uh, which shows uh, upper motor neuron integration. So, you know, those are very uh, important uh, things for one molecule to achieve. And these are also, these problems are also shared by, uh, you know, the upper motor neuron disease um, spectrum. Uh, you have mitochondrial problems, you have ER stress, protein misfolding problems. So I'm actually very optimistic and hopeful. And believe me, like we have numerous meetings and uh, we are very hopeful about NU9, um, especially within the context of upper motor neuron diseases. That makes me so excited. I remember you presented last time on NU9. So I, I'm, I'm really excited for the update and all your future your future movement that you've made in the last, uh, I think it was what, nine months ago that you spoke. So congratulations on that. Um, for the next question is for the uh, UCHL1 study, what are the next steps and how can we follow the progress of this study? All right, so I'm also excited about this gene delivery to upper motor neurons because this is um, the future, I think, especially for rare diseases. Because if uh, you have a rare disease and let's say your mutation is very rare or your condition is very rare, it's very hard for one drug to work for everyone, especially for rare diseases. It's very hard to find one drug to work for all rare diseases, right? So I think we are moving towards personalized medicine approaches that we will be able to treat patients and uh, more uh, you know, individual uh, methods and applications. So let's say we know the mutation in a patient, right? You do uh, gene vast studies or um, you know, whole genome sequencing and you know the mutation or you know the genes that have problems. And you may also know the uh, uh, converging paths or you know, uh, the problems that occur in these, uh, in these neurons. Okay, so then you can actually say, uh, I'm going to develop a therapeutic application for you. I'm going to, I know what your upper motor neurons need for survival. You know, uh, they are having, I don't know, ER stress, oxidative stress, maybe axonal degeneration, maybe hyperexcitation, maybe hypoexcitation. So by looking at the uh, genes and by also doing proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics from their blood, serum, and plasma, you will have a good understanding of what is the underlying cause of the disease for that particular patient. And it may be different from another patient. That's okay. But you will understand for that particular patient, what is the main problem? So once you know what is the main problem, then you can actually begin to develop treatment strategies just for that patient, okay? And this could be, be a combination of multiple genes or combination of maybe some other drugs, but you will develop a treatment strategy for that patient. And that can also include uh, gene therapy so that you can say, for example, I know you have mutations, I'm making this up, but I, I know you have mutations in the kif 5 a gene, okay? And because this gene is mutated, you have axon transport defects, you have axonal degeneration and so forth. Of course, we will do many preclinical studies to see if correction of that mutation will have uh, implications at a cellular level, at a mechanism level, at a tissue level, the, all the different levels, and it's not toxic and so forth. 
then you can actually uh, begin to begin to develop uh, studies such that you inject one time virus with the uh, wild type or non mutated form of the gene so that the upper motor neurons will actually receive the uh, wild type form, the non mutated form of the protein that they need because the mutant form is not functioning, right? Then the, that may give a relief to the neuron if this is the reason why they show vulnerability. So I'm not saying this will be the only, but it may be in combination by other uh, th therapies. And it would also allow us to have more personalized approaches. And I think gene therapy to ALS and also especially HSP and PLS patients, because you know currently there are no drug no clinical trials for them. And, um, and I don't think any, any drug companies will be interested in them because there are very few in numbers. But if you see HSP or PLS patients at the age of 12, 13, this is a very young. And if they know the mutations, let's say SPG7, SPG14 or something, like they know the mutation already. So I think in the future, it, it may be possible to go uh, with gene therapy directly to upper motor neurons so that you can actually improve their uh, function, uh, health, function, and then connectivity. Wonderful. Uh, our next question is, can you explain how genes associated with the genetic ALS can also be mutated and lead to other neurological diseases? Say, say it again. Uh, sorry. Can you, all, can you explain how genes associated with genetic ALS can also be mutated and lead to other neurological diseases? Yes, so this is very interesting because, for example, uh, there are some genes that are mutated, and when they are mutated, let's say you have ALS, right? But there are also some patients, the same gene is mutated, but now they're, they don't have ALS, they have something else. So they share uh, some mutated uh, genes, okay? So I think uh, when the diseases or disease names were established, you know, about 100 years ago when uh, doctors were uh, doing clinical investigations and uh, you know, naming them Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, and so forth, we did not know the genetics. We did not know proteomics, lipidomics, metabolomics. We didn't know anything. So all these diseases were named or were characterized based on clinical manifestation, right? But 100 years later, we now realize that these genes or these dis diseases are not really uh, independent and islands, right? They are not very um, they, they are not very different. There are some common uh, domains. There are some unique domains. So uh, it is okay for one gene mutation to cause one thing and then another thing because it's also combinatorial. Like uh, associate, there are associated genes that. Uh, you know, there are, it's not just one mutation. If you do a whole genome sequencing, you would see that there are also uh, problems in other regions, in other diseases, and some mutations may not be detected because those mutations may be in the intron region. For example, the C9ORF, right? The, it's the intron expansion. And if you were to look at the mutations in the exon, you would not detect them because it's, the in, it's in the intron and it's the expansion. So there are also different um, forms of mutations. And I think that uh, we should focus our attention to the common and um, problems that are shared by ALS, HSP, PLS, even Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, so that we actually bring, it, bring therapies to neurodegeneration, okay? And understand why these neurons degenerate and then build therapies based on that. I think we should forget about this disease, that disease, that disease. So it's not really the disease, it is the mechanism or it is the lack of the mechanism or lack of function that results in disease. So I think by curing patients, we get disease. So, right, I mean, in the past, it's, it was thought that you eradicate disease and patients get better. But I think it's the other way around. You help patients, you improve the health of the patient, and that's how you eradicate the disease. Because disease is an entity, like the main focus is the patient, because if there is no patient, there's no disease. So if you improve the patient's health, then that's how you cure the disease. And I think um, that it's like a, a big tree 
with many different branches and each branch is a different disease, but they have common denominators and they have also some unique aspects. So we need, we need to focus on the common denominators to be, to be more impactful. Thanks, that was a great explanation. I can see McFinn clapping. Um, <laughs> You spoke during your talk about the differences between upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. And the question coming up as to why then do both cells um, start to die in ALS if they are so different? No, that's the complexity of ALS. And that's why ALS is so vicious. And that's why ALS progresses so fast. And uh, it is a disease of the motor neurons. And uh, that's why, for example, PLS patients, they can live longer than ALS patients, right? And uh, the, uh, the spinal motor neurons in ALS and upper motor neurons, uh, they are both unhappy. And it may, there are some reasons that they share for their unhappiness. And I think one of them is uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, metabolomic problems, axon transport defects, excitotoxicity, you know, and then there may be also some unique aspects. For example, we're, we are beginning to realize that the upper motor neurons, the lipid homeostasis is extremely important for upper motor neurons and not so much for spinal motor neurons. And for spinal motor neurons, there may be things that are really important for them and not so much for upper motor neurons, but there are some common uh, biology and pathology. And so that we actually need to focus our attention. But again, you know, I, I think this is why it's been very hard to find a cure for ALS, because we are trying to cure both the cortical component and the spinal cord component. And I'm going to tell you this, all the compounds that are in clinical trial right now have never been tested for their uh, impact uh, on upper motor neurons. We don't know if any of the compounds that are on clinical trials actually would work on upper motor neurons. Can you imagine? They have never been tested because the idea that upper motor neurons will die anyways, you know, who cares about upper motor neurons? So they, the FDA didn't even ask, how about upper motor neurons? Do you have data to show that upper motor neurons would also improve? They never asked. So now uh, maybe all these failures in clinical trials is just, we're trying to build the bridge by just fixing one leg. I mean, just by fixing one leg, you're not gonna fix the bridge. You have to fix both legs, okay? And, and I think that's why we need to incorporate the upper motor neurons in preclinical uh, trials as well, preclinical studies as well. And we need to um, get better at this because I mean, how many times have we failed in clinical trials, right? So I don't think we have the luxury to fail in clinical trials. And, uh, and that's why I think the inclusion of upper motor neurons in the equation is very important. Wonderful. All right, the next question is, do you believe that these processes with UCHL1 can also happen in sporadic ALS? Um, oh, I can only say, I think, I, have, I don't have data. Uh, the reason is we don't have good models for sporadic cases, right? We only have models for, uh, you know, the mutations or the pathologies. So there's really no sporadic mouse model. Like <laughs> normally they don't have ALS, right? Um, there is one group in Australia though, by hyperexcitation, by inducing hyperexcitation in the upper motor neurons, they actually can create or can generate a mouse model which mimics the sporadic ALS because they don't really have any mutation that by just cortical hyperexcitation, the neurons, uh, because the neurons begin to degenerate and you know they, they may have some uh, impact overall to the motor neuron circuitry. But because TDP pathology is widely observed in ALS, ALS FTLD, in patients who don't even have TDP mutation, have TDP pathology, right? So I would imagine that if you cover a SOD1 mutation and TDP pathology, that's a very wide coverage. And there's something about SOD1 and TDP, we don't understand why, but patients with TDP pathology, all right, they have all these TDP, uh, including inclu uh, phosphorylated TDP, including inclusions in their brain. But the patients with SOD1 mutation, guess what? They don't have TDP pathology. 
So we don't understand why, but there is some um, you know, differences between SOD1 mutations and TDP pathology. So if we can actually uh, obtain similar results by these two unrelated and non-overlapping models, I would imagine that this is a very good coverage. And I would imagine that even this uh, sporadic ALS patients may have a similar outcome. Because remember, I showed you the apical dendrites of human patient bed cells. The sporadic ALS patients' bed cells were actually also having these apical dendrite degenerations. So it's not really the mutation. So I would imagine that the sporadic ALS patients may also benefit from this. Wow. I'm learning so much. Um, for the um, UCHL1, um, is there a supplement that people can take that might promote uh, the production of this enzyme? That no, you know? no, I don't know. I don't think so. Cool. Thank you. The next question is, what gives you the most hope for the future of ALS research right now? Oof, not just one, many. <laughs> I think th this, these are really exciting times for ALS research uh, and not just ALS research for you know, um, neurodegeneration research. First of all, we begin to realize how complex the system is, that's fine. But we begin to realize also the underlying causes of neurodegeneration. So we, we know what is really the problem. And once you know the problem, you can begin to develop therapies, right? So that's very good. Our understanding is at its best. Of course, more um, understanding is coming up, but you know, we are currently understanding um, the some of most of the maybe you know causes for uh, vulnerability. So that's very good. Second is the unity in the ALS community. Patients are amazing, right? Or for example, you are one of them. The patient driven. Uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it, you are the driving force, right? You get people together, you start conversations, you're like an enzyme, right? You, should, like, you get things done. The same is true with ALS researchers, like, and the same is true with ALS clinics. So there were many ALS clinic uh, initiated at many, many different regions in the United States, okay? But then they started forming connections. So that's very good. The NEILS platform trial is excellent because then it's not just one center, it's multiple centers. So now one of the problem with, was when you start a drug clinical trial, how are you going to recruit patients? And how are you going to find th that many patients? Because FDA wants, I don't know, this number, that number, it's unbelievable. Like, how can you recruit that many patients? But now there are like six trials, seven trials, all going on. Right? So then, you know, there's momentum in that. And then there's also interest in drug companies. I mean, there were so many times in the past, the drug companies were saying, hey, you know what, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to touch it because we failed, we failed. Now there are uh, small, small startup companies, many companies, one drug, another drug. Let's try this. Let's try this. So people are really excited about, uh, about this. Like They really want uh, to find a solution. Patients want, caregivers want, scientists want, uh, companies want. So if everything is aligned, so that's actually a, a good momentum. And now, of course, uh, the government uh, or Biden also signed into law, like uh, trying to find cures for ALS and FDA is changing its language so that, you know, there is, I don't know, like, you know, you can act actually have off target uh, use, uh, you know, you can, uh, even if you don't have a phase three approval, you can work with the company. Your co so then there are many ways that the change is happening. We did not have this five years ago. We definitely did not have this 10 years ago. And I think that's why this is very good. And if you ask me personally, in my lab, like we are doing NU9 drug discovery, right? So we are discovering drugs compounds that improve the health of diseased upper motor neurons because of this reason, that reason, that reason, like we go very deep. Then we have gene therapy, gene therapy directly to upper motor neurons. We're looking at, I mean, UCHL1 is one of them. We have a couple more genes to try in our lab. So then, you know, this gene, that gene, we got gene therapy. Then we also do biomarker studies. We're trying to find biomarkers that help, help us identify the timing and extent of upper motor neuron loss. So you have biomarkers, you have drug discovery, you have gene delivery. I mean, and uh, 
we don't sleep, okay? <laughs> we keep writing grants, we keep doing experiments, and it's not just like we have so many projects, we don't know which one to do. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago. And I think that's why it's exciting times. And I really want to see uh, ALS patients uh, as survivors. And I think it will be possible because once we understand why their upper motor neurons or lower motor neurons are feeling the pain and why, what makes them upset, I think it would be like, oh, you were upset for that. Oh, we have a solution for this and we can actually help them. What I realized with our gene therapy and with NU9, because we found that it's the mitochondria, it's the ER and NU9 improves mitochondria, improves ER. So normally they would show progressive degeneration, right? That's the normal path. But when we give them NU9, they say, wait a minute, why do I have to degenerate? My mitochondria is doing well, my ER is doing well, and I don't have that many protein accumulation, and my apical dendrites are fine, I have the spines, and they stop degenerating. There's no reason for them to degenerate, right? So we can actually stop the degeneration path and make them even more healthy. So it's not cut in stone. Like, you know, we can, uh, if we can make them happier, then I think they will come back. They will come back to life and say, you know why? You know what? Why do I die? I'm, I'm going to back in the conversation. And so maybe we can recruit them back in the conversation. So I think it's possible. And, you know, I think it's worth, <laughs> worth working like 24 hours a day for this, right? Well, we want to say thank you because I know everybody here is very excited and, and so grateful for all the work that everyone, um, you know, your lab and, and everyone else is doing for ALS. It is huge and there has been lots of progress made in the last, last few years. Um, our next question is, how can organizations like Everything ALS and the rest of the ALS community support this research and other research you are doing? I mean, it's, if it, I don't think it's just me. I think uh, you're doing a good job, you know, uh, supporting uh, other researchers. And um, so I wouldn't like to turn this into a conversation or just support my research. I think, you know, you should support research in general and not just me. I think uh, you should identify researchers whose uh, research is, um, you know, cutting edge, up and coming, collaborative, you know, changing the fields and uh, has impact and identify those researchers and support them. You can even initiate collaborations. Like you can say, oh, do you know this? Do you know that? And have you worked together? We can give you some funds to work together. That may also be very helpful. And, uh, you know, for, for my research, I, I am actually uh, the scientific director for a long swim. It's a nonprofit organization. And our goal is to support uh, collaborative research and to bring people together. And I'm very helpful for their commitment and, you know, for their help. And I also try to help other researchers, especially young scientists, uh, you know, to do research and to recruit uh, students and new scientists to the ALS field. And um, so, you know, of course, any help is appreciated, I think, for, a for all uh, ALS uh, researchers. But I, I really wish that my R01s and big grants get funded. So th th that would be very um, meaningful. And the work that requires the most, the most support is the biomarkers. Because without the biomarkers, when we go to uh, clinical trials for NU9, they're going to ask us, what is the outcome measure? Like, how do you know this works, right? And now I'm working on uh, identification of those biomarkers. And you know that study um, has to be, um, you know, ha has to move forward as early as possible, so that when the time comes for phase two, I will have the results. Wonderful. All right. The next question is, if the, if this study goes through a clinical trial, it will also be evaluated again, be evaluated by looking at whether it is slowed down, it has slowed down the disease. But since this treatment addresses only the upper motor neurons in exactly half the problem, it will by default not, it won't, it won't show any significant results. So a potentially great drug that should work with other drugs to address lower motor neurons might be discarded. The question is, is there a way to avoid this major risk of discarding a potentially great treatment? And next question is, as this moves forward, 
would it be classified as a surgical procedure or still be constrained by the FDA as drugs usually are? So okay, so this, long question question. The, this, this question is, a, is about UCHL on gene therapy or NU9? UCHL. Okay, for UCHL1, I think we are long ways going into clinical trials, okay? So this is just to show uh, that at a cellular level, there's improvements. Yes, we have to do macaque monkey studies. We have to do other studies. First, we need to show that there's no toxicity. There's no activation of astrocytes, microglia, that you know, this is not toxic. This is not bad, right? We have to show this over and over and over and over again, okay? And then, but if, if in the future this goes into clinic, which I think is possible, because for Parkinson's disease patients, you know, they do deep brain stimulation. And for those surgeries, they actually cut through the cerebral cortex, they go into the striatum, okay? Or not, not I mean, not maybe exactly to the striatum, but they, it's, um, it's a very massive penetration to the brain. So with this injection, it is actually uh, injection to the brain to layer five. So you are not cut, cutting through the brain, okay? And with a proper uh, neurosurgical uh, assessments or neurosurgical uh, surgeries, you can go to layer five uh, of the motor cortex. And with minimal uh, invasion, you can do those surgeries. And so those surgeries can be done. And actually, Clive Svensson's group in Cedar sinai are actually uh, doing clinical trials where they inject uh, engineered uh, cells that secrete a growth factor. And uh, they have already shown that after the surgery, patient wakes up, patient is fine, and they follow the patient. So bottom line is those surgeries are, uh, are possible and are feasible, okay? And that's why I'm actually hopeful that uh, in the future, we may be actually getting uh, you know, approval to perform, these, to perform these treatments, especially for rare disease patients who don't have any other means of uh, treatments. And that would uh, be um, uh, you know, a feasible approach, especially for uh, rare disease upper motor neuron patients. Um, the same question also now applies to NU9. The one about, um, I think it's probably similar answer that we just spoke about the UCHL1 um, trial, but then for NU9, does that also, because it only, it, or it um, focuses on the upper motor neurons, is there a risk that um, the lower motor neurons won't be treated that we might get a negative result for this study? So kind of a bad, um, interesting question. So I, okay, so uh, to be honest, my personal uh, opinion is that uh, it's not a risk because uh, if we can actually improve the health of the upper motor neurons, uh, there are studies show that when the upper motor neurons are healthy, the upper motor neuron circuitry is healthy, and even the spinal motor neurons and neuromuscular junctions become healthy. So this was uh, Gretchen, Gretchen Thompson in, again, uh, Dr. C uh, Clive Svensson's lab, she showed that if you remove uh, misfolded SOD1 toxicity just from the motor cortex, uh, she was able to improve the spinal motor neurons and the neuro neuromuscular junction. So especially we as humans, we depend on our upper motor neurons so much. The upper motor neurons are exceptionally important for us, okay? And uh, it, let's say even if you don't see an impact, an impact on the mouse model, which they have uh, interneurons in their spinal cord, the motor neuron circuitry wired is a bit differently. In the, in the patients, in the humans, the cortex spinal cord connection is actually uh, more robust and more profound. So then if you improve, improve the health of the upper motor neuron, I would imagine that the spinal motor neurons would also be happy because the spinal motor neurons get their input from the upper motor neurons, right? Most of their input. And when the cortex also doesn't speak to spinal motor neurons, spinal motor neurons sit there and say, I don't know what to do. I don't know, like I'm here, but I don't know. The cortex doesn't tell me anything. What am I gonna do? And they don't start the movement, right? Even though they are healthy in the spinal motor neuron and they also show degeneration, right? They also show degeneration. But then if you actually make them connect to each other, make them speak to each other, Spinal motor neurons may also feel, 
Oh, thank God you're talking to me. All right, what are we doing, buddy? Like, where, which muscle am I activating now? Tell me, you know? And then the spinal motor now speaks to its neighbor, now speaks to its collaborator. And they, they may actually improve each other too, right? So I don't think that uh, even though they are distinct, they are brothers, they are like, or they are like, um, they are co-workers, they are working together. So if you improve the health and the stability and function of one, that definitely will have a positive impact on the other. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's great. Um... And also our uh, recent uh, Journal of Neuroscience, not Journal of Neuroscience, Nature Scientific Reports paper, uh, show that uh, when a new nine is given with Adderavon or with Rulozol, there is some edit effects, right? So that's perfect because some ALS patients are already taking Rulozol or, or uh, already taking Adderavon, right? So having a new nine doesn't hurt. It actually makes it better. So then we may even begin to think of combinatorial treatments. So we don't expect that one drug is going to cure both A and B. Maybe it will be a combination of multiple drugs. And why not? Absolutely. No, I, I think that that's kind of definitely the way that we're, we're headed and we're definitely learning that it sounds like we need to hit both at the same time. So it's good. Uh, uh, next question is, is, N, is NU9 currently recruiting for trials? <laughs> no, I wish I could say yes. No. Uh, so we, first we will do phase one and then we will do phase two. And so, right, I get many emails, like, when are we starting? When I wish, I wish we could start as early as possible, but now I'm also beginning to learn that there is a long path between discovery and clinical trial, right? So yes, the discovery is very important and all the drugs that we see in clinical trials or all the drugs that we take now were once a discovery, were once a, you know, a finding. So we found that NU9 is the first compound to improve the health of disease upper motor neurons, great. But taking that information, that knowledge into, let's go into patients, let's treat ALS patients, HSP, PLS patients. Oh my God, so the you know di dialogue with FDA and getting the uh, toxicity studies, pre-IND enabling, oh my God, believe me, the, the team is like 50 people team. So uh, it is ongoing, but uh, yeah, boy, it's taking a lot of time. Yeah, so I'm also learning myself. Um, has there been any thought to incorporating the UCHL1 in either nanoparticles or quantum dots instead of direct injection? Ding, ding, ding. Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I don't want to know, I don't want to say because I don't know, it's uh, worth the investigation. And yes, quantum dots are very, very powerful. And you know they're not toxic, they're also cleared away and so forth. But then they may not be very specific because if they're in the bloodstream, they go to anywhere, right? So we want very specific direct motor cortex injection because uh, UCHL1, if you look at the expression, other organs may express them and too much UCHL1 may be bad. So I would still, uh, you know, uh, I, I would still um, prefer having direct direct motor cortex injection, so that I don't want to uh, just give a lot of UCHL1 to the whole body. Because about UCHL1, when you overexpress UCHL1 in epithelial cells or in non-neuronal cells, okay, too much UCHL1 is also not good. So then you need to be very directed and I'll only give it to the neurons that need without side effects. That's why specificity is very important for our gene delivery. Uh, the next question is, so Congress recently approved $100 million for ALS research. This individual is asking, how does one get a piece of this uh, funding? If you know, tell me. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't know, but I think it's not for researchers. I think it's just for patients and caregivers. And I think that's how it needs to be because patients need to have access to drugs and those are expensive. And I don't think that money is for researchers. We already have NIH, NIA, DOD, okay? So that money, I, I as a researcher, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to apply or get money from this. I think that money should be spent by patients and caregivers so that uh, the compounds or drugs which pass phase one and phase two 
will be made available to them because you know that is also expensive because you go to the company and you say i want this drug and your doctor files the ind or or irb or like it, it's a big process it's a very long process so the company also makes the drug just for you or for your friends and they deliver so it's an expensive process and i think that money should not be for researchers it should be for patients um you spoke and the last prior question about um, some side effects with UCHL1. And um, the question came up as to what side effects are there and have you seen any in the mouse models that you guys made? Yeah, so it, uh, it may, it may in, uh, in non-neuronal cells, okay? So it may uh, lead to uh, cell proliferation, but in the neurons, of course, they don't cell proliferate, like they don't divide. So we don't have that problem uh, in, the, in the brain, in the neurons. And, and we have not seen it in the mouse models or in, in any, any of our studies. Interesting, wonderful. Um, well, we are going to um, have that be our last question. We wanna thank you so much for your time. This has been extremely informative and I know a lot of information that I will definitely be re-watching and, and learning and, and looking up too. So um, thank you so much for coming back. We appreciate every time that you're here. And um, for everyone on this call, this is the time that we get to unmute ourselves, turn off the recording and um, hear what you guys think, what you have on your minds and um, see what's going on in the ALS community. But again, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hear from you soon and see some great big updates as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support. And I think uh, once we identify the uh, biomarkers, uh, we will actually have um, a big progress, especially in the uh, NU9 and also other drugs uh, and looking their impact on the upper motor neuron survival. So if we find uh, biomarkers for upper motor neurons, the ongoing clinical trials may also include upper motor neurons in their investigation. They may say, all right, how about upper motor neurons? Do we also improve their health? So I think finding upper motor neuron, uh, uh, biomarkers for upper motor neurons will change the fields and will actually uh, make discoveries uh, emerge even faster. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation.